trip up in space up so high. I'm taking a trip high up in heaven. I'm taking a trip to be with my And anything potentially is art, and indeed part of the power of what he is doing as an artist is, as he would put it, taking the things that have been thrown away by others that are essentially dead and giving them life again, giving them meaning, making them part of the message that God has for the rest of us. And again, without going into detail, we see the wonderful diversity and variety of that. He starts to take broken TV sets and melting them and making wonderful assemblages that have their own kind of funky power uh, and interest. He does various techniques of printing where he tries out methods using aluminum plates to produce um, serial um, um, objects that he is using again as a way to communicate his message and so on. There is uh, a whole thematic in his work in terms of found images. We see in this piece here, he started to experiment with dribbling oil on various surfaces and then in a sense meditating over that imagery and seeing in the chaotic swirls that something emerges that has meaning effaced most often. The other, of course, theme that defines Howard Pinster and defines him both in terms of his artwork and defines his vision, his religious vision, is in keeping with his background as a Baptist preacher and what we're talking about, what we're looking at uh, at this point is one of his works that is an apocalyptic work. If you ask what the message was that in the 80s he was attempting to communicate, it was that most important message for all of us infidels, that is that we need to get right with the Lord because the end is upon us and the end is coming very soon. And that was a passionate concern of Howard Finster's in this period. The hell and damnation side of it uh, tended to be most obvious in this period in the 80s. And some would say, and I, I basically agree, that what's interesting about his evolution is that as he continued to evolve as an artist, the negative and heavy aspects of damnation that were so obvious in the early 80s and mid 80s uh, became progressively less strident, less rigid. There was more of an ameliorative vision, more of a kind of compassion that overwhelmed the damnation. As we follow the timeline through the 80s, it's not simply that he is becoming progressively more adept at artistic uh, technique. He's learning how to blend color. He's learning how to mix paints. He's doing this all on his own, and that is fascinating in its own right. But there's another significant event, and that's roughly in this period of the mid-80s, 85, 86, 87. This is when he's also becoming famous. This is a time when, I talk about, when we talk about fame, he becomes a pop celebrity. Uh, various rock bands in this period like R.E.M. and Talking Head, for whatever reason, selected him as a kind of guru figure. He appeared on various popular TV programs, the most significant being the Johnny Carson program, and he became a cult celebrity uh, in many ways. This is also the time that has an important connection with us here at Lehigh because it is right about at this point in the mid-80s or more specifically in 1985 that Ricardo Vera and I first encountered Howard Finster and I will not go into the full story it was a serendipitous event, a happy accident. We have here in the brain room the first folk computer art that Howard Finster did in 1986 at Lehigh University on an early generation graphics machine, an Amiga machine. Some people 
fondly remember their Amiga machines. There, in fact, is a, apparently a, something of a cult of Amiga machines on the internet. And we had Finster do the first of the computer folk art here at Lehigh University. But let's continue the story here, except I'm tempted to point out one other thing that is expressive of uh, Howard Finster. He was, as we see here, the folk artist, he was the preacher, he was the tinkerer, he was the jack of all trades. He was also something of a folksy philosopher poet. And when he hit his stride, he was capable of some wonderfully rhapsodic and poetic phrases and uh, sentiments. And one of the most famous is from one of the signs he had in the garden, something that is now owned by the High Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. I took the pieces you threw away and put them to gather, as he said, by night and day, washed by rain, dried by sun, a million pieces all in one. And that certainly has a lilt to it. It certainly has a rhythm. It certainly has a sentiment uh, that's a significant sentiment. And if that is a message from God, it's a good message from God that even those of us that perhaps still fall into the category of infidels should take to heart. So as we go through the the timeline spinal cord, and I think as you've been viewing this, you have probably been struck by the fact that what I have been referring to as the timeline, and we see the, the dates, etc., that are important, seems to have some reference to this wonderfully sinuous and somewhat strange uh, snake-like line that goes around the entire room. So here we are, we're moving through the 80s, He's at the peak of his fame. Fame is, in some cases, starting to get the better of him. As we know, he is still trying to get the message out, and the more messages that he gets out, the better. The issue of knowing exactly how many messages he has gotten out became increasingly important uh, to him. I think many people will know that at a certain point, by the late 70s, early 80s, he starts to number all of his works. And we see some of that kind of obsessive concern for the quantity of his output. We have one of his number sticks here, where he not only numbered each individual piece, but he kept a record of the production that he was uh, involved in at any one point in time. So here we are, and as he's becoming more famous, he is having to step up production to meet the demand, and he was most willing to do that. But of course, he's an old man uh, as well, and uh, both his health as well as the pressures on him are starting to become overwhelming. I want to draw attention to one other thing here, which is you will see a screen that is showing a video this is a video done in July of 2001, and it's a very haunting video because it's one of the last, if not the last, recorded or videotaped conversations with Howard Finster. Often the problem for those that try to film Howard Finster is that as a old-time preacher, he would go into a preaching harangue and you couldn't shut him up. And sometimes that just became too much. This has a special poignancy because he's not in his preaching mode. He's in a much more reflective conversational mode. Uh, and clear, it's clear there's a kind of sadness that he's working with. And it's a very touching episode in terms of what was going through his brain uh, at that particular moment. Both, as I say, a kind of sadness and, in a sense, also still seeing uh, the greatness that is in him. At this point, we're moving into the 90s, and I think the one thing that is worth saying is that this is the culmination of those darker forces that we alluded to as he become 
as he became more and more famous. And it was in the 90s that because of his fame, he had to retreat from his paradise garden, that the demands on his time were simply, as I said before, overwhelming. And his dear wife, Pauline, had the good sense to tell him, you know, Howard, we've got to find a place where we can lead our own lives again and you can do the work you need to do. As I said, we're talking now about the 1990s and I suppose I want to make uh, one important point, which is this, that I suggested that we could characterize the 90s as the waning period of his career. He had peaked at some point in the 80s. That was his masterwork period. Fame starts to overwhelm him, family intrigue, health problems, collectors who were no longer pleased with his output because they saw it as no longer the kind of interesting work that he was doing in the 80s. He was doing, he was in a sense copying himself and producing uh, small works that were essentially works for the tourist trade. Some would say, in fact, that a way to periodize his career as an artist is to think of the period in the 80s when he was producing most of his truly interesting works as the tractor enamel period, as he referred to the paint that he was doing, the using at that time and the fact that indeed things were painted with a brush. As he uh, grew older and as his health deteriorated, he found it harder and harder to hold a brush steady. And he realized that if he was going to maintain the output, he had to switch to some other form. And he switched, and this is again, the nomenclature becomes controversial. Some would call it the Sharpie period or the laundry marker period or as he preferred, the paint pen period, because he always, when this issue was brought up, uh, and some would bring this up to say that his work had deteriorated, he would um, quickly come back and say that it's not necessarily the case at all. I'm using very expensive paint pens, and they're the equal of any kind of enamel paint I was using earlier. And we have some things here being displayed that indicate the fact that he still was capable of producing truly intriguing and wonderful objects, whimsical objects, more serious objects. Some of the icons in terms of his cosmology or pantheon reappear. Elvis Presley, of course, being one of the key figures, but we see other things as well. The angel, of course, is ever present, but also, as we see here on the wall, uh, Mickey Mouse being another addition to the pantheon. We also tried to show here some of the implements of his work. He was very self-conscious about that. Uh, one of the very interesting pieces here on the wall is at one point he gathered up some of the pencils and pens and brushes that he had been using and did an assemblage with them, uh, which again has its own striking and fascinating qualities and again is very expressive of him as an artist and him as a human being, as well as wonderful other objects here uh, on the shelves. His paint pens that we were referring to, nothing ever went to waste, so all of the drippings uh, from his earlier phase where he used enamel paint into paint cans, he would then suddenly start seeing faces and he would produce an art object out of the drippings from his painting. As we move then towards the turn of the millennium, fame is still very much a part of his uh, life, but in many ways his health was deteriorating and it was becoming increasingly difficult for him not to dwell on the fact of his own coming death, uh, and the fact that, as he would put it, he was going to have to return to that other world uh, that he came from. And, of course, we're talking about the turn of the millennium. So for 
an old-time Baptist preacher who was uh, baptized in the blood of the Lamb and was concerned with the apocalyptic message of getting right with the Lord because the end is upon us. What more symbolic uh, moment would anyone want to live through than the passage from the 20th to the 21st century, which he does. Although, as I indicated earlier, it is perhaps worth saying that for all of the intense apocalyptic of the earlier period and the thought that here we are at the turn of the millennium, that this would have sparked a new intensity in his apocalyptic uh, message, uh, that really didn't happen. There was a mellowing of Howard uh, by this time for all sorts of reasons. Uh, that brings us to the last wall here in Howard's brain. A wall that, in terms of the, the, the cord that connects and lays out his life, the spinal cord, the snake, the timeline. As we see here, quite interestingly, it morphs into a very famous symbol for those that know something about medieval uh, alchemical tradition. It morphs into the Ouroboros, the primordial snake that consumes or eats its own tail. The theme that the end is always a new beginning. In this case, the end, Howard's end, really was a return to the world of spirit. A world, as he put it, where he no longer had to work himself to death to produce messages, masterworks, art for the rest of us, because up in heaven, God is the only artist, and they're all masterworks, so he doesn't have to worry about that any longer. We also see, as we indicate here, this increasing sense of his own messianic destiny, not just that he was chosen, but that he was chosen to suffer for the rest of us. So in some of the imagery that he produces throughout this period, there is a sense of his own immolation, his own crucifixion, his own sacrifice, in a sense, for the rest of us. Some would call that a Christ complex, and as a matter of fact, it is. And even better, as a way to end the imagery in his brain, and one can certainly imagine this happening. We have this wonderful painting by a California artist, Kata Billups, and the wonderful image, in a sense, to close out this tour of Howard's brain is the image here of Howard giving Jesus Christ a tour of Paradise Garden. And what I think is so both haunting and touching and evocative of something that really has significance here is the expression in this case on Jesus' face. Jesus is clearly dumbfounded by what this stranger from another world has accomplished. And as you can see, Howard is just carrying on. He's telling Jesus to look over there, then look around at what else he's done. Uh, and Jesus is fi clearly finding it difficult to keep up with Howard. Well, that's telling us something about all of those messengers from outer space that punctuate the history of human culture. Jesus and Howard and Buddha and Elvis are all part of the same lineage. I'm taking a trip to be with my friend. I'm taking a trip just to be with my Jesus. I'm taking a trip just to be 